it may turn out that some of what I have to say may ease your concern, Trevor, about what you failed to do in part. <coughs> Um, but first, I just want to begin by saying that this book deeply enriches a domain of scholarship research experience that has historically been underserved. And that is the frontier where the dynamics of the political process meet the dynamics of the market, and particularly the dynamics of the financial markets. Um, and this notion of the establishment of the market economy, and particularly the financial markets, as an autonomous domain, a regime that has its own rules and laws, and which is exempt from the broader moral economy, is a very powerful concept. And of course, there's a resonance from 1825 to 2008-9, when nobody went to jail except one junior banker who actually was a foreigner. Um, now, one question that that offers, and I'm going to come back to this, and this is where I think I, I would kind of give you at least a partial pardon. Um, the book push, certainly it pushed me to think hard about what are the conditions under which the moral world reaches out and embraces the financial system and imposes punishment? Because we do have examples that come after 1825. In fact, in some cases, very much. But I'm going to come back to that. First, I do want to point out one of the other more specific residences that I found very powerful is the manner in which John Law's system in France, creating an enormous sea of liquidity in the context of a dysfunctional fiscal system, seems an awful lot like what happened in this country and in the Western world, but particularly in the United States, in the aftermath, in the context of the Great Recession, with austerity descending from what we thought, or let, perhaps I should say, ascending from a corpse which we thought had moldered away to assert itself across the Western world, in fact, across everywhere but China, um, between 2010 uh, and then uh, under the impact of COVID, the, quote, unconventional monetary policy serving as the functional equivalent of John Law's system in motivating an enormous flood of liquidity into financial markets, into the financial system, which in turn engenders the unicorn bubble, the excesses and extensions of which fully meet the requirements of uh, being resonant with the South Sea bubble. Um, so that, I thought, was a really, really useful um, connection. Um, one aspect of this, and I think the discussion in the book of the currency bullion controversy in Britain approaching 1825, establishing an intellectual frame in which you have the basis for laissez-faire uh, at a pretty deep level. David Ricardo is a really, really strong thinker and political presence, not unlike world that your colleague Brad DeLong knows better than anybody else in this room, a world in which efficient markets, rational expectations, the notion that markets are self-correcting mechanisms that can be relied upon uh, creates an environment in which we can have the global financial crisis and then constrain the response to the global financial crisis. Um, now, I do want to point out, and for those who are interested in modern, the modern uh, echoes uh, that this book generates, um, <clears throat> some things worth taking a look at. Uh, what happened to the Bering family in 1890, the first Bering's crisis? They didn't go to jail, but Bering's was, had been, as 
demonstrated in the book in the years up to 1825. The, the historian of the, of the Barings Bank referred to it as, the title of the book is The Sixth Great Power of Europe. Um, the Barings partners, most of whom were members of the House of Lords when that was not um, a, a, a kind of way of, of, as Boris Johnson said, embarrassing people who used to walk, people who were in the House of Lords by nominating your 28-year-old personal assistant to be, to be a peer. Um, the Barings were wiped out. They were liquidated <coughs> in 1890. Um, so something was going on there. And I do think there's a linkage for those who really want to read deeply into this history. There's a linkage from this book to David Kinnerston's great three-volume history of the city of London, which is replete with scoundrels, some of whom enjoy impunity and some of whom wind up in the slammer, uh, having been engaged in financial manipulations and frauds of, of one kind or another. But then, um, coming a little more closer to our time, not quite my generation, 1932-33, the Pecora hearings are an extraordinary moment in the financial history of the United States. After the Great Crash, after the bank uh, crisis, the Senate Banking Committee, when Hoover is still president, with the Republican chair, organizes an investigation of Wall Street. It goes nowhere, there's no energy in it until Roosevelt becomes president, induces the now Democratic chair of the Banking Committee to reactivate the hearings. An extraordinary lawyer called Ferdinand Pecora hammer and fist, hammer and tongs, goes after Wall Street. Uh, Sam Insull, the great entrepreneur of, of the utility system in Chicago, flees the country ahead of the endowment, uh, indictment. Uh, the chairman of the National City Bank, largest bank in the United States, goes to jail for tax evasion. Richard Whitney, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, goes to jail for stealing his client's money. There is no impunity at that moment. But then, you know, even closer to home, and this I remember vividly, in fact, I knew some of the players in this game, in um, 1990, there was a savings and loan crisis. It was nothing like the scale of the global financial crisis. But under that radical, woke president, George H.W. Bush, 200 bankers, including Mike Milken, went to jail. They did jail time uh, for that circle, that, that crisis within a segment of the American financial system. In 2000, the um, leading, well, the chairman of WorldCom and the then not quite chief executive, but he became chief executive of Enron, were each sentenced to 25 years in jail for their frauds in the context that were revealed in the context of the breaking of the tech bubble. Um, and then, of course, most recently, uh, Sam Bankman Fried and FTX. I don't know, we don't know how long he's going to jail, but I think we are highly confident he's going to jail. Not with, he has not uh, enjoyed impunity. So a question is, in this context, is, global, is, is, is 2008 the anomaly? Or was it really the reassertion of a central theme of the book. I think the fact that the book asks, makes one ask those questions is, 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 is part of its, of its value. So let me just um, close my two brief remarks. <laughs> um, the, oh, I should add, by the way, the other thing that's going on right now is the question of the immunity of the Sackler family, the impunity of the Sackler family. Um, yeah. Well, there you go. I turn it over to it. And not it. Um, uh, but the um, rolling back, one of the themes that emerges in the latter part of the book is how um, London's rise to dominance as the financial capital is enabled uh, by <coughs> the House of Barings and the House of Rothschild being the financiers of sovereigns including the British sovereign, but by no means only the British sovereign. So I think of, um, and, and how they finance, particularly the British government in the context of the Napoleonic Wars, and I think of New York 
Wall Street, the House of Morgan rising to a dominant position in financing the British government in World War I and emerging with the US and New York emerging as the financial hegemon uh, of, the, of the last hundred years. And um, with that, I will end except to note that this is a plum pudding of a book. You find extraordinary gems. And the ones that I wrote down, the one I wrote down here, financial crises and financial speculation often come with innovations. And Minister Necker securitized annuities on seven-year-old Genevois smallpox survivors on the ground that they were going to be the most long-lived, and so selling the annuities was going to maximize the return today for a state that was functionally approaching bankruptcy. That's a great gem to discover. With that. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>